Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome. Come on in. Find your place. We are glad that you are here. Glad you're joining to worship with us this morning. Why don't you go ahead and grab your bulletin. If you open it up to the middle page, there's the Heidelberg Catechism in there. Let's stand together as our call to worship. Let's remind ourselves we've been doing this uh, every week as we've gathered in 2021, reminding ourselves of these great truths of the faith that anchor our soul and inform our worship. So I will read the question and then together let's respond. Why is he called Christ, that is, anointed? Because he has been ordained by God the Father and anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who has fully revealed to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our redemption, our only high priest, who by the one sacrifice of his body has redeemed us and who continually intercedes for us before the Father and our eternal King, who governs us by his word and spirit and who defends and preserves us in the redemption obtained for us. Why are you called Christian? Because I am a member of Christ by faith, and thus share in his anointing, so that I may, as a prophet, confess his name. As priest, present myself a living sacrifice of thankfulness to him. And as king, fight with a free and good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and hereafter reign with him eternally over all creatures. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the great calling that you have given us as sons and daughters. Oh, as your church gathers this morning, God, I pray that we would be reminded that we are no longer strangers and aliens distant from you, but you have taken rebels to your will. You have taken those who resisted your grace and law and salvation, and you have made us sons and daughters. You have joined us in your family in Christ, and therefore we are brothers and sisters one of another. O oh God, as your family gathers this morning, we pray, let the name of Jesus be exalted let hearts be bowed low before the great and holy King whose name we have come to exalt, whose greatness we have come to proclaim. Let it be more than words. God, we're, we're just confessing right now that many of us have dragged our sin into this room. We have dragged in affections for that which we know is against your will. We've dragged in grudges against people who we refuse to forgive. We've dragged in cold-heartedness towards you, and we stop right now and confess, oh God, our hearts are so prone to sin, so prone to turn against you and towards ourselves, and yet we acknowledge, oh God, the depths of our sin demands a Savior. And so we stop, even now, confessing the wickedness in our heart, and we say again, O oh God, in your grace and mercy, save. In your grace and mercy, show us Jesus and cause us to put our trust and our hope in him for salvation and no other. We pray in Christ's name. And the church said, Amen. For those who are so prone to sin, to turn from the living God, this is such good news from the Psalms. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and rich in love. Lord is gracious and compassionate. He 
slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good. The Lord is good to all. And he has compassion on all that he has made. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far He has removed our transgressions from us. The Lord is gracious and compassionate.
what compassion you have towards your children, O God. That you would take rebels and make them sons and daughters. That you would take our own hearts and minds that right now we know we can recount the greatness of our sin and wickedness and rebellion in our heart. And you have in your sovereign grace separated us from the guilt of that as far as the east is from the west. Oh, what could our hearts say but praise the Lord. Be exalted, O God, who saves. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, again, welcome. We are glad that you are here with us. Would you do us a favor and grab that little red book that is in your row and just fill that out? Let us know that you are here. Let us know how many people in your family are here. If you're a visitor, uh, we'd love to get more information from you. Just want to be able to welcome you here. If you're joining us online as well, we'd like to welcome you. Uh, you can go ahead and text that number on the screen to check in. Uh, but we just want you to know that you are welcomed here, that we are excited to get together as God's people to lift up his name. So kids, right from the bat, before you run back and grab your uh, coloring page, sort of follow along for the sermon, I need to know which kid has the birthday closest to today. Aiden, when's yours? April 11th. Myra, when's yours? April 8th. Anybody closer to today than April 8th. Chris, when's yours? The April 5th? Is Chris our winner? Can we count you as a kid? Oh, we got one back. Where's March 11th? That's really close. Let's go with March 11th. All right. So for the Nickham family who won all because of Carson. Thanks, Carson. Uh, we really want to be encouraging our families to be pouring into our precious children the Word of God. So this is just a daily devotional. It's from Nancy Guthrie. This is fantastic, awesome material. Carson, you want to run up and grab it? Good. This is not for your birthday. You have to share it with everybody else. Thank you. He's like, why did I have to come up in front of everybody? <laughs> uh, we have other resources. Uh, that's just sort of a plug, like... Parents, remember, this is our responsibility towards our children, to train up our children in the admonition and instruction of the Lord. There's uh, some simple things uh, like daily bread that's out there. Uh, we have some other resources we would love to recommend to you, but be plugging in with your kids because we want them to engage with God's Word right now. So kids, if you want to run back and grab that coloring page, if you haven't done it already, grab a clipboard back there. There's some crayons. Uh, we want you to be able to follow along with the sermon and know that God's Word is for you as well. Uh, one other way that you can do that is the journey to the tomb that Pastor John has created, that uh, he has some printed out copies out in the hallway, and it's also available on our website, EdenWorshipCenter.co. Uh, again, just sort of a devotional thought, some activity things as you as a family approach this Easter season, uh, remind ourselves that Christ did die, that he was buried, that there was a tomb, and he's no longer in it, that we have a resurrected Savior. So uh, parents, families, invest in that with your kids. So one other thing that I want to mention with regards to Easter, which is rapidly approaching, and that is there was a lot of things last year that just got canceled and by God's grace, things are doing a little bit better, but we still want to sort of hear some feedback from you. So uh, if you think it is a good idea for us to have an Easter breakfast, we want to hear from you. If you think it's a bad idea, we want to hear from you. So we had sent something out earlier in the week uh, just asking the question. You can get on Facebook and uh, answer the little poll, yes or no, on there. Uh, if you are the person in the room who's like, uh, I don't have... Facebook, I don't know what that is. I don't have the interwebs. What can I do? Uh, just take a piece of paper and write yes or no on it. Yes, I think we should have an Easter breakfast. No, I don't think we should have an Easter breakfast. By the way, if it's a no, it would be good if you gave some, uh, like, and here's what I think. Uh, because the church is not a democracy. Amen? 
It's actually a theocracy. Uh, Christ is king over the church. But we do want to hear what the majority of the people are thinking. And yet, if the minority has a very, very good concern, we want to be uh, cognizant of that as well. Does that make sense? So you can drop that in any of the offering boxes. Uh, just a little slip that says yes or no. Uh, we want to hear from you on that. Uh, we look forward to the day when things are just so open that this is a distant memory. And hopefully our fellowship has been strengthened because we saw the need of it in this time. So uh, one of the good reminders, you, you see this in your bulletin, is as we are beginning to meet together, and I, I talked with a few people this week whose churches are not open, uh, who live in areas where they can't meet together, uh, what a great opportunity for us to be inviting friends and neighbors. We have some invitation cards that you can give them. Uh, it has the time of Sunday school and our worship service address, points them to the website, but just take advantage of that and be inviting people to church. Not just invite them on a Sunday morning and hope that does it. Um, finding ways to get involved and have conversations with people to get into their lives. So either I'm being removed from the stage or Dad has an announcement. Let's find out together. Actually, that uh, turned out to be a great segue. Uh, I wanted to share with you that we just received word just moments ago from Pastor Visaya in the Philippines, Metro Manila, asking us to pray. You know, it's like 10 o'clock at night for them uh, because they're that 12 hours ahead of us. But just today, almost 8,000 new cases of coronavirus um, were discovered in Metro Manila. That doesn't tell us how many yesterday, but they are on a very, very hard lockdown. And it's very difficult for them and for the churches there. And I said that uh, we would pray. So if I may take my liberty, let's just pray for them right now. Father. I thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ in the Philippines. Thank you for the relationship that you have opened up uh, for us to partner with them. I pray for Pastor Visaya. I pray for the saints there and for that nation. Father, would you, would you just stay this pandemic there? And I pray for your grace. I pray for your provision. Lord, I know people are on lockdown. They can't go to work. Uh, they can't get the food they need. They can't earn the money to buy the food they need. Life is so difficult for them. And we just intercede on their behalf and pray your blessing would be upon them, your grace and your provision. And we give you thanks for this in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Thanks, Dad. Uh, two more announcements from your bulletin. Uh, we are signing up to have people help with mowing the lawn, being part of that team this coming summer. If you want to do that, we would love to have you help. If you say, man, I, I wish I could find a place to get involved and serve in the church, but uh, unlike Jamie Kaufman, who I had, to, I had to stop her this morning. Like, she wanted to come up and make an announcement, and I said, no, Jamie, you can't. Unless you've changed your mind, and I guess, no, okay, so maybe not. But you're like, I don't ever want to have to get up and say anything and into a microphone. Uh, but you can be involved in helping with just take care of some of the simple things like the lawn around here. Uh, we would love to have you sign up for that. Uh, Tim Cleveland kind of heads that up. He can show you how to use our giant fun grasshopper that's fun to drive around. Um, and then one more thing that's in your bulletin, and that is uh, Secret Church is coming. So uh, the... We're going to meet on April 23rd. It starts at 7 p.m. and it goes till 1 a.m. If you've not been a part of this, it is phenomenal. It is the Word of God in fast forward, <clears throat> much like they do in persecuted countries where it is illegal to gather as we are doing on a Sunday morning like this. And so they have to sort of sneak into uh, darkened houses and meet in the middle of the night. Uh, so one more, one more thing to mention, and that is actually the thing that Jamie was dying to get up here and say is that because of the time with the Easter breakfast, uh, we're just going to assume for the minute that everyone says, yes, let's eat together. Uh, it, now, if that changes, then we'll, we'll cancel everything. But we've got some clipboards that are passing around. There's sort of 
uh, one for each of the main three sections. So you may have to pass it across the aisle to make sure that we cover the sections. But if we can just sign up to cover the food for that. And then, uh, like seriously, be praying that God would give us discernment together, that we would wisely lead this church in a way that's good for our spiritual health and physical health. Amen. Uh, so speaking of physical health, we want to pray this morning. Most of you probably got the text update this morning. We were going to be praying for Isaac. Uh, Isaac Nickham is part of the uh, proud tradition of the Nickham family, which much like Forrest Gump runs everywhere. Uh, I have seen Isaac's dad, Rusty, just like just in the middle of nowhere, just run out, roll down the window. I'm like, did your car break down? No, no, just run to ship Shawana after a church service from here. Uh, and yet, as, as some of that sort of running and training stuff started coming up, uh, Isaac was feeling some limitations in his own body and breathing and things that runners usually acclimate to. And I'm not going to try and say the medical word, uh, but the, the basics of it is because he had COVID, it caused an enlargement in the right side of his heart, and that right side is now leaking blood in and out. Uh, so when they did a chest x-ray, they actually, even though he's not sick, they found congestion in his lungs uh, because there's a respiratory issue and a heart issue directly caused by the coronavirus. And so they, it, by the way, this is the type of heart condition that you hear about when a young person is in gym class and just drops dead. No, nothing that led up to it. It's just an instant thing. So uh, we want to first and foremost... Thank God for his amazing grace. That It's going to stink because the doctor told him absolutely no sports for the next six months. Is that right? Uh, so you're taking a runner family and then you're like sidelining him. And yet, what grace that this happened. Especially in a time where it's kind of difficult to get in and see a doctor. And, you know, they're not super thrilled about you coming in. That they found that, that... His life has been preserved, but we want to be faithful to what the Word of God says. Is anyone sick among you? Call for the elders. Let's anoint him with oil. Let's pray together. So if we could just have uh, the Nickham family come on up and the elders come on up. And we want to just do that. We want to be faithful. We don't believe that there is anything magical in anointing them with oil. Uh, we do believe it, it was a symbol, number one, of, of healing in biblical times. We, we see the, the story of the Good Samaritan where he takes the injured person and he pours on oil and wine. So there's this idea that that was part of treatment, but it was also the symbol of the Holy Spirit, it, this anointing, this claiming that God does of his people. And so we want to do that. If you would just stand together with us, uh, we're not going to have everybody grouped together just for a little bit of uh, safety here, but we want to pray over this young man, God's healing touch. Just for the sake of playing guitar, would you yes. do that part? And then go ahead and read in prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessing of the Nickham family. Father, we thank you that they have reached out in faith to ask for prayer for Isaac. Father, I thank you for the grace that you have lavished upon him thus far, protecting him, keeping him safe, Lord. Father, I pray that as they continue forth from here, that your grace will be evident in their life, that you'll continue to live at, lavish it out on them, that their testimony will shine through brilliantly through this, Father, that people will see how they deal with this and just wonder how in the world can somebody have joy through this? How can somebody give thanks through this? Father, I pray that your grace will be powerful in their lives. Father, I pray that you will give the doctors wisdom I pray that you'll give them discernment as they uh, look at uh, the progression of this and how best to treat it and what needs to happen, what doesn't need to happen. But Father, even more than that, we pray for your supernatural touch in Isaac's life. Father, we pray that you would reach down and heal his body of this. 
We pray that doctors will be dumbfounded, scratching their heads because what they were powerless to do, you weren't powerless to do. Father, we voice that as our desire, but our greatest desire is that your will be done in Isaac's life, that you will be glorified through his words and actions throughout this. Father, that you'll be glorified in the final outcome of this. Father, we pray that Isaac, as time progresses, will be able to use this as an opportunity to minister to other people going through the same thing, that where others can't associate, can't feel what's going on in those other people's lives, he will be able to, and that you'll make this a powerful opportunity for ministry for him in the future. Father, I thank you that you are sovereign, that you are in control. And I thank you that regardless of the outcome, it is what is absolutely best for Isaac. And it is absolutely what is perfect according to your perfect plan. Father, be glorified through this. Be glorified in Isaac's life. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, let's remain standing and sing together with, and Isaac, God just laid this on my heart as we were praying for you, Uh, and I think this, this kind of applies to the rest of us too. You have been specifically a young man with a heart to know God, know theology, be a part of the, the argument, the, the debate, convincing people. And I, I really feel like God's call to you in this moment is now trust God. Um, it's not, not just about what we know. It's not about how many scriptures we have memorized. It's do we trust that God that we know and for you and for the family to put your trust in him. And I, I think for the rest of us as well that this is not some academic exercise that we do on a Sunday morning that we come so we get more knowledge. No, we know God that we might trust him. That when these moments come, what separates Christians from non-Christians, it's Christians trusting God. They get sick, they suffer, they have problems, but they trust in God. So let's remain standing and sing together. We picked a a brand new song to help you uh, express this. When our hearts feel dark and desperate, uh, a brand new songwriter named Charles Wesley wrote this hymn a couple hundred years ago for us uh, that we might look to our downcast soul and say, Arise, our hope is in God. Arise, my soul, arise Oh, shake off your guilty fear The bleeding sacrifice On my behalf appears And before the throne my surety stands Before the throne my surety stands for my name is written on his hand where he ever lives above for me to intercede his all redeeming love and his precious blood to plead for his blood atones for every race his blood atones for every race and sprinkles now the throne of grace 
Shake off your guilty fear, my soul arise. Five bleeding wounds he passed, received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers. Oh, he strongly pleads for me. Forgive him, oh, forgive, they cry. Forgive him, oh, forgive, they cry. And don't let that ransom sinner die. Oh, my soul, rise. Oh, my soul, arise, and behold the risen Christ, your great high priest, your spotless sacrifice. And oh, my soul, arise, for God owns you as his child. So shake off your guilty fear, my soul arise. And my God is reconciled, and His pardoning voice I hear. He owns me as His child. I can no longer fear. With confidence, I now draw nigh. With confidence, I now draw nigh. Father, oh, I'm a father. Your great high priest, your spotless sacrifice. And oh, my soul arise, for God owns you as his child. Shake off your guilty fear, my soul arise. Just sing it one more time. No, my soul arise. God owns you. God owns you as his child. Shake off your guilty fear, my soul Kevin's just got a quick word that goes with this song about God's deliverance. Uh, some, some of you may know, some may not. Um, I'm 51 years old, and uh, I had a lifelong, uh, most of my life, bondage to uh, alcohol and sometimes drugs, mostly alcohol. Um, Tuesday, this Tuesday, will mark 
13 months that uh, God's grace has delivered me from that bondage. Uh, I can only call it a miracle. Uh, no, no temptation, no desire. Uh, I, I called on God. Uh, he has, I, I just wanted to share, sometimes we need to praise God for some of the miracles, and I can only call it a miracle. It has been 13 months, um, and truly, no desire, no temptation. Uh, praise God. Amen. Amen. Now, amen. Let's give thanks to God. Let me tell you this, brother. The enemy of our soul doesn't play fair. So, if all of a sudden you find that later today, tomorrow, next week, this desire comes back and hits you. That's what I want you to do is just rejoice because that's the attack of the enemy because you've given testimony to God's grace and his faithfulness. Amen? Amen. 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 Bless you. Thanks, man. So the Bible is super clear. What we do when we struggle is we don't tuck it away and hide it. We confess our sins one to another. We pray for each other that you may be healed. Let's do that for our brother Kevin right now. Would you just join me as we pray for him? God, we thank you that you alone forgive sins, that you alone set captives free. So right now, we don't pray that there wouldn't be temptation. We thank you for that. We don't pray help things go better. We pray heal him. Let this sin that has been a part of his life be so dragged to the cross that it is killed forever and Christ is exalted because you are the God who saves that our sin my sin Kevin's sin your sin was nailed once and for all to the cross once and for all and once and for all you offered up your life and for one and all and for one and all the perfect sacrifice atoning blood was shed love Yeah. 
His voice will be heard. Creation resounds. He's victorious. God, what can we say in light of this great salvation? What testimony, what condemnation can our sin bear against us? Can the accuser bear against us when our God, by the power of his blood, said it is finished? We stand in hope of this great salvation. Man, I don't even want to say amen at the end of that. At least not amen that means it's over. God, may it be so. May that always be the story of your church. Here and in all times, in all places, let it be so. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I cannot think of a better introduction to our study of the New Covenant in Hebrews chapter 8 than what we have just sang and heard. There was a question a couple weeks ago as Justin and Aaron shared some of their struggles. And the question was, why do we do this in front of our children? Shouldn't we remove the children from that kind of a setting so that they don't have to hear that? That's not Christianity. Christianity is not, not some keeping up of appearances where all things are right and good and easy. Our kids know we struggle. Our kids know that we hurt and that we walk through dark and difficult times. You know what they need from you, Mom and Dad? And Kevin, thank you again so much for having the courage to share that as a Christian, I sin and I struggle and I fall short of the glory of God. But here's what makes me different from the rest of the world. I cast my hope upon Christ alone for salvation. And his redemption and forgiveness is enough. And it is finished and complete. And kids, you have hope because you're not perfect either. But there's a God who saves those of us who are so far from perfect. Puts the righteousness of Christ on them. Man, I wish... There were two things. I I wish I uh, could have had you all turn around and seen the glory that was on Justin's face as we heard that testimony and then sang that proclamation. It was this is awesome, which made it really hard for me to sing with this giant smile on my own face of this is what the body of Christ looks like. This is what the new covenant looks like. The old covenant is a covenant of works. I have to do the right thing, say the right thing, keep the law perfectly enough or at least good enough to earn God's love and the new covenant that we're going to be looking at today. So open up your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 8 is actually an argument that says Christ has done that on our behalf. That everything good that we do is now a response to what God has done. It is not causing God to love us. So 
This morning is going to be a little bit different than what we normally do because last week we read all of Hebrews chapter 8 and we're going to do that again today. Last week we talked about some of the verses that were in there and this week I want to focus us as we look at Hebrews chapter 8 on a few main elements, looking specifically at the new covenant. What does it mean for us to be new covenant Christians and not Christians who are trying to live up to the old covenant? Uh, just a reminder of what a covenant was. It, it's an agreement, a contract, uh, some, something that defines the relationship. And specifically in the text we're going to read today, God defines it by saying, I will be your God and you will be my people. Let's stand together as we honor the word of the Lord and read from Hebrews chapter 8. We're going to read the whole chapter together. So hear now the word of the Lord. Now the point in what we are saying is this, we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, speaking of Jesus, he would not be a priest at all since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy, a shadow of heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on this mountain. As it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it's enacted on better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers. On the day that I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so... I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those, day, those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, for I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. God, we thank you for your word. We pray now bless the reading of your word and the hearing of your word. May it truly cause our hearts to live and be illuminated in Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Real quickly, where we're going to be headed this morning is three main points of why the new covenant is better. It is better because of its place, which is situated in heaven and not on earth. It is better because of its promises, an unconditional covenant, not, not a covenant that is constantly determined on whether or not we can keep our end of the bargain, and it is better because of its power once and for all. So let's look very quickly at some of these things. It, it's important as a context to this to remember that the Jewish people for 2,000 years had held so tightly to this old covenant to these, these laws that define my relationship with God, to these sacrifices that dealt with and mediated uh, with the priest my sins before a holy and righteous God. And there's two things that all people do not like. Number one, the way things are. And number two, anybody want to guess? Change. Everybody hates those two things. We, we grumble and complain about how things are, uh, longing for some ideal uh, old days or, or some heavenly days to come, uh, but we also hate change. Anything that shakes it up. Let, let me give you just a glorious example of this. Anybody else ever been tempted to turn on the news and saying, oh no, our country is headed such a terrible direction, it's all over, like we're, we're just in, anybody, don't raise your hand, just quietly nod your head in shame to yourself. Uh, let me give you a historical 
reference for this. When the railroads were first introduced in the United States, some people feared this is the end of everything. And it's kind of, kind of strange to think about now, a little perspective. Here's an example of a letter that was written to President Andrew Jackson, dated January 31st of 1829. It makes me wonder what people are going to write 150 years ago about the time we are currently living in. As you may know, Mr. President, railroad carriages are pulling at enormous speeds. In addition to endangering life and limb of the passengers, they roar and snort their way through the countryside, setting fire to crops, scaring the livestock, and frightening the women and children. The Almighty God certainly never intended that people should travel at such a breakneck speed of 15 miles per hour. Martin Van Buren, Governor of New York. Isn't it strange how perspective changes what seemed like an almost hopeless situation? Well, again, 2,000 years the Jews had held to, this is what we cling to. This is what defines our relationship with God. And God had given very specific instructions to his people. In Exodus 25, 40, you have these listed in your bulletin, instructions for the tent of meeting, what, what that was to look like. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, instructions for how the law was to be taught and kept. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 19, for what the, tem the temple should look like, God told David, who was the king at the time, all this is contained in the plan that was written according to the instructions which the Lord himself gave me to carry out. These were God's instructions to his people. All of this was the direct command of God. But uh, here's one of the first fill in the blanks for you in your bulletin. God himself defines how he is to be worshipped and what is our relationship to him. Not us. Not our feeling. Not our society. Not what's culturally appropriate. Not what the government deems appropriate. God himself defines who he is how he is to be worshipped, what our relationship with him is to look like. Last week, we were reminded by Albert Moeller that when we look back in the Old Testament, we're meant to say, in light of the New Covenant, I should have seen that all along. It buried, hidden, and then sort of emerging as time goes on in the Old, old Covenant. So we're going to talk about Old Covenant. That, that's primarily the Old Testament, that God's... Uh, covenants that he had made with Abraham and Noah and Moses uh, for what it looked like to be God's people. And the new covenant, primarily in the New Testament, uh, in Christ, what that looks like. The new covenant, here's the first point, the new covenant is better because of its place. This is something I hadn't really considered a whole lot, but read with me back in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2 again. Now this is the point of what we're saying. I appreciate when people stop and do that. In case you ever got lost in the conversation, and they go, wait, wait, wait. Here's the point of what I'm saying. That's what the writer of the Hebrews does. We have such a high priest. He's been saying we need a high priest that's greater than the priests who serve, greater than the angels, greater than the law. And he says we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. So let me ask you a question. In the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, what was the primary focal point of that covenant? The promises made to God's people, we just read through Exodus, what was it they were looking for? What was the promise that was held out in front of them? It was always, fill in the blank here, the promised land. This was an earthly covenant, that the place of that old covenant was always Land. It was about a place to Abraham. Genesis, we're not going to read all these. Genesis 13, 15, he says, See, I'm giving you all this land and to your offspring. To Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 8, he says, I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession, for I am the Lord. To King David, he promises who is in the land, I'm going to give you peace in the land, and your throne will rule over it forever. That's read all through 2 Samuel chapter 7. And yet that promise was temporary at best, incomplete at best, not fully coming until Christ comes. And even now, we await the fulfillment of that new covenant promise. This is one of the fill in the blanks. Get, get your pen out. Write this in. Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every earthly blessing in heavenly places. Everything on earth has 
John is laughing at me. John, why are you? Oh, I read that entirely wrong. I'm sorry. Scratch that out. Let's try the next one. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every, go ahead and hit the next slide, spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Our promise is not actually that every earthly blessing will come your way. Christians get sick. Christians get cancer. Christians get into car accidents. Christians lose their job. And yet, this is a new covenant based on a spiritual reality that is greater than just an earthly reality. The new covenant is better because of its place, and the new covenant is better because of its promises. Well, there's no better example than looking at verse 6 in Hebrews 8. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old covenant as he mediates is better. Since it is enacted on better promises. What are the promises? What, what were the promises that were found in the old covenant? You'll be blessed in the land. You will conquer your enemies and they will not conquer you. Your crops and your livestock will be blessed. Rain will fall in the season and sun will shine. Your descendants will multiply and you will have peace in the land. Come on, church, think with me. What is the one element that connects all of those things? It's the land. You will be blessed in the land. Your descendants will multiply in the land. Your crops will grow in the land. So that, those are the promises of the Old Covenant. Well, what are some of the terms of that Old Covenant? If you keep my law and walk in obedience, you will receive the promises. If you disobey my law, you will receive a curse. If, I don't know if I stuck this in the bulletin or not. I try and stick in every scripture you, so you can follow along, trace them later, or even turn to them before we get there. Uh, all of Deuteronomy chapter 28 tells that story. The blessing and the curse. I'm setting it before you. Choose whether or not you want to be in this covenant. Now, some of us might say, yeah, but didn't Jesus say the same thing in the new covenant? Didn't Jesus say in John chapter 15, verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, part of the answer, but before we even backtrack and find the context for that, could be found in the context in which Jesus says that. that notice how we, at a, a first reading we could say, if you obey my commandments, I'll love you. And if you don't, Im implication, you're out. You were in, but now you're out. Even before we look at context, Christ precludes us from saying that by saying, it's just like my relationship with the Father. Does the Father... How many of you believe in the Trinity in this place, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the three in one. Does the Father ever have an opportunity to say to the Son, I'm done with you, you're out? No, this is an eternal union that he shares with him. And Jesus says, this is going to be a mark that you have that union with me. This isn't an example of how you end up losing that. So kids, let me give you an example. I, I need a kid to be a volunteer. Do I have any kids who want to volunteer to help? Everybody, why is everybody pointing at Liam? Liam, is everybody just, all right, Liam, come up. You've been volunteered. Get up here. All right, I want you to stand right down there in the middle. I have a gift for Liam because I love him. This is awesome. It's got a button here, like, pew. so exciting. You have been given, come on, go all the way up, an umbrella. That's yours. It belongs to you. I gave, did it belong to you before? No. How'd you get it? I gave it to you. Okay, good. I, I just want to make sure we're, we're clear on this. Uh, so I have given him an umbrella. Uh, kids, come on. What are umbrellas for? What, what do they do? For the rain. To keep... Aubrey, you're so smart. They keep you dry. So if... Now, can it rain in here? No. Why not? Because there's a roof. What if I had a bottle of water that had holes poked in the top? Can it rain in here now? Now, kids, what should... Oh, he already did it. All right, so take a little step forward there, Liam. So if, if Liam is our example, now where do you get this umbrella? From me. Where, where do we get our salvation? 
from God. It's a gift from God. Ephesians 2 says that, right? So uh, right now, this gift... All right, let me see. Are you, are you dry or wet? Dry, that's awesome. Now what happens? God has given us this great salvation, kids. Like God has given us his spirit within us to, to help us know right and wrong, to lead us in the right direction. But have you ever had times where your mom and dad told you to do something and you said, Mm-mm, nope, I'm going to do what I want to do. Even though I gave him this umbrella, is it mine or his? It's his. It belongs to him. Can he choose to put it down? Can he choose to say, nope, I'm going to do it my own way. I'm not doing it your way. Pastor Matt told me to hold this up, but you know what? I'm not doing it. I'm holding it down. What happens now? <laughs> what do you think, kids? Dry or wet? Wet. Does he still have an umbrella? <laughs> that was awesome. All right. Can you say thank you to Liam for helping us out? Thanks, Liam. You're all done there, wet boy. Go and, go and, you've been baptized. <laughs> Here's our temptation. We, we come, as Christians, we come into situations and things in our life where all of a sudden we feel like, I know I shouldn't have done this. I, I know I shouldn't have yielded to temptation, but I did. And now I think maybe God doesn't love me. I think God's angry with me. I think God's rejecting me. And I have to do enough good things in my life to now re-earn God's favor. I, I got to pray enough. I got to read my Bible enough. I got to go to church enough. Those are good things to do. But do those things save us? No. God has given us salvation as a gift of his sovereign grace. Now, I love what he did at the end. And that was unscripted. Even we've had times. Come on, adults. This is you too. We've had times where we put the umbrella down. We said, I'm doing it my way. What happened? All of a sudden, when we were removed from that protection, we experienced the consequences of those choices. If you step out from that, that's what happens. And yet, what did he do? After he had stood there long enough, he'd had enough of that, what did he do? Put it back up. You know what the Bible calls that? Repentance. There's no shame in that. We don't look at somebody who puts the umbrella back up and goes, what a dummy. We look at someone who repents, a Christian who repents, and we go, that's the only thing that makes sense. So kids, you have that on your coloring page. It's a picture of an umbrella, uh, and I want you to think about There's a little fill in the blank for you. If I step out from under it, I get wet. That's your fill in the blank for you this morning. Here's what Jesus said. Here's the context of John 15 that we read earlier. A chapter before in John 14, verses 15, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He doesn't say, if you love me, or if you keep my commandments, then I'll love you. He actually says, our love of him is what causes us to live a certain way. To put sin to death. To trust in Christ. That order is so important, you cannot miss that. Which comes first, God's love or our obedience? God's love. In the Old Covenant, it was obedience. In the Old Covenant, it was the law that earned us God's love and salvation. In the New Covenant, it's better. Think about this. All of the Old Covenant promises are for this life. Go back and look. Go back and read through Deuteronomy, some of that uh, promise that God made to his people. There was no promise that if you kept the law perfectly, you would go to heaven. That's not in there. It was all for this life. You'll have blessing in the land that you may live, but there's no promise of eternity. So much so that when 2,000 years has elapsed, by the time Jesus comes, the two major parties in the Jewish faith, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, disagreed like night and day on what eternity looked like. Pharisees had believed, and they had kind of pulled this, they were people of the book, they had pulled out of uh, what they started to see showing up in the Old Testament prophets, these, these glimmers of what looked like eternity, and they believed there was uh, something, that the bosom of Abraham, or something where good people go and bad people go someplace else. The Sadducees hadn't seen it, and they said, nope, there's no resurrection. Once you're dead, you're dead. You remember when Jesus has the young man come to him and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He was a Pharisee. He knew that there was eternal life, but catch this, he didn't know how to get it. 
Think about that for a second. The whole Old Covenant is about this world. It's not until we start seeing glimmers. Psalm 71, just jot it down. We're not going to read it. The psalmist says, uh, it's either David or somebody writing after. I think it's somebody writing after who sort of uses David's language. He says, though you made me see troubles, many and bitter, you will restore my life again. From the depths of the earth, you will bring me up. As the prophets go, it gets more and more clear. Isaiah 26, 19 says, but your dead will live and their bodies will rise. Daniel chapter 12 almost sounds like a beautiful New Testament version of what we see. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life and others to shame and everlasting contempt. But it's not until Christ. That's the old covenant. It's not until Christ inaugurates the new covenant that this blurry picture of the old comes into focus. Oh, and there's no better, no simpler example of this than John 3, 16. Come on, you know it. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Here it is. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That promise was missing from the entire old covenant. The new is better. But it's not just about an eternal promise. It's an unconditional promise. Writer Bruce Shelley in his book, Christian Theology in Plain Language. If you're not familiar with Bruce Shelley, I would encourage you. This would be a good book. He also has a church history in plain language. Both are very good for understanding our faith and the context of our faith. He says this, Contracts are broken when one of the parties fails to keep his promise. If, let us say, a patient fails to keep an appointment with the doctor, the doctor will not be obligated to call the house and inquire, where were you? Why didn't you show up for your appointment? He simply goes on to the next patient, and his secretary makes a note that that patient failed to keep his appointment, and the patient may find it harder next time to see the doctor. He broke an informal contract. According to the Bible, however, the Lord asks, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, as if that were possible. God says, I will not forget you in Isaiah 49, verse 15. The Bible indicates that the covenant is more like the ties of parent to child than doctor and appointment. If a child, this is brilliant, if a child fails to show up for dinner, the parent's obligation, unlike the doctor's, isn't canceled. Moms, right? I made dinner and you didn't come in. Lock the door, right? I don't know where you were. Dead to me. No, the parent finds out where the child is and makes sure that he's cared for. This is so key. One member's failure does not destroy the relationship. A covenant puts no conditions on faithfulness. This is the picture of the new covenant. Covenant puts no conditions on faithfulness. It is the unconditional commitment to love and serve. That's what God has given us. That's the new covenant promise we find here in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 9, where he says, It's not like the covenant that I made with their forefathers on the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. Christian, that should rattle you. Anybody ever sinned and fallen short of the glory of God after being a Christian? Under the old covenant, God has every right to say, you were not faithful, I have no concern for you. Oh, but the new covenant is better because of its place. It is a, a heavenly covenant because of its promises and now because of its power. When I was a kid... It was a commercial. Many of you will remember it on TV. It generally had to do with some guys sitting around some campfire type setting with a, a fire crackling and the sun setting in the background. And one guy looked at the other and goes, it just doesn't get any better than this. They were wrong. Uh, <laughs> that, that was not the best that this life has to offer. But I think verse 12 in Hebrews 8 might just be it where God says to people who, apart from his grace, have no hope of salvation, for I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. If we have any idea of what our sin looks like, that should grab our attention. 
Look around the room. Would you, would you just turn your head and look at the people who are in here? And I want you to think this as you're looking at them. These people have deep, dark secrets in the recesses of their heart that I hope, uh, they hope that I never find out about because they are, are so ashamed of their sin or their sinful past, and it's lurking in the shadows. And here's what God says to that. I know about it, and I've decided to be merciful and remember your sin no more because I've covered it in Christ. That is not the story of the Old Covenant. Uh, at the beginning of this book of Hebrews, in chapter 2, verse 2, we're reminded what that looked like. He says, uh, in that Old Covenant, every transgression or disobedience received what? It's just retribution. Ain't nobody putting that on a coffee cup and selling it in a Christian bookstore. Every sin, every transgression or disobedience receives its just retribution. It's just like some guy with a fist standing there like that. Isn't that good news? Doesn't that, that warm your heart? But Christian, let me ask you, is that same thing true in the New Covenant? Was that just Old Covenant? Has God just decided to forgive because he felt nice today? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says this, For Christ also suffered once for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Now listen very carefully, Christian. Every single sin in your life is fully punished in Christ. Now if you choose to be outside of that umbrella... It will be fully punished in you for all of eternity, separated from God. And that won't be enough to pay it off. That's why it's an eternal punishment. But for those who have trusted in Christ, every sin is punished. Every disobedience is punished. And it is punished to the full where he says, it is finished. It's done. We sang it this morning, now completed the work of love doesn't just stop there. Verse 10 says, I will put their laws in their, I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. Again, he's quoting from the prophet Jeremiah out of Jeremiah 31, and the prophet prophetically foretells the coming of the Holy Spirit. How is it that God has written his law on our hearts and our minds? It is in salvation he has given us the Holy Spirit as a down payment, a deposit of that which is to come. Oh, but think with me, in the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit never indwelt believers. The Spirit came upon them and enabled them to do something or was with them. So think of Samson. What made Samson strong, kids? We have the best kids. Most of the coloring pages that we did as kids, uh, the focal point was Samson's long hair, and generally huge muscles. Now, we have no idea what Samson looked like, but it was not his muscles or his hair that would make him strong. It was the Spirit of God that would rush upon him and he would tear them apart. But that's as good as it got in the Old Testament. And then Jesus, promising, unveiling these things to his disciples, John 14, verse 17 says, The Spirit of truth, you know him. For he dwells with you, will be in you. That's brand new. That's brand new. There was no indwelling Holy Spirit to guide us into truth, to lead us towards righteousness until Jesus comes. In the old covenant, the presence of God's Spirit in a person's life could be affected by their obedience or disobedience. In the new covenant, it says that it's a gift of God, like the gift of the Holy Spirit, it's irrevocable. It's without repentance. It's in Romans chapter 11. That's why we are careful, we say this again and again, about what we sing here. There are songs that I deeply love. There's some really great songs on the radio. And either because of where they come from or the message that's embedded in them, we don't do them. And, and for all the people who are like, that old fuddy-duddy. Like, he's, you're making it way too big a deal. You're, you're over-spiritualizing this. Let me just tell you, we don't do my favorite song from when I was a kid. We don't sing it. In fact, my favorite song from when I was a kid is only Bible verses. There's no other words thrown in. It's just Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God. 
Renew a right spirit. You guys remember this song? The music is beautiful. The, the melody is beautiful. And it, it says it again and again. For those who have struggled with sin in our lives, I, I, there were so many times when this song touched my heart. And it, Just repeat that. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. And then comes this swelling chorus. God, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Those are 100% Bible verses and we don't sing it on a Sunday morning. Does anyone want to guess why? That's an old covenant song. In the old covenant, your obedience or disobedience could mean the removal of the Holy Spirit, could mean the removal of God's pleasure and blessing in your life. You are no longer part of the family of God, but not so in Christ, Christian. Where our sin, we cry out, create in me a clean heart. We cry out with David in Psalm 51, Lord, search me and know me. See if there's any unclean way within me. But we never have to cry out, Take not your spirit from me. Because he will not do that in the new covenant. We didn't earn it by our works. We will not lose it by our works. It is the gift of God that no man should boast. I love that song and we don't sing it. Because I want us to be new covenant Christians. And many of you go, yeah, he's still weird. It is what it is. And yet, how many times have I heard Christians mired down in their sin say, have I gone too far? Does God no longer love me? Have I lost my salvation? Don't listen to me. Turn your Bibles back from Hebrews 8 to Ephesians chapter 2. Get your pen out. When those dark nights of the soul come your way, I want you to open up your Bible to these two passages that we're going to read. And say to your soul, this is talking about me. Here's the state God finds us in. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. It does not say you were struggling in your sins. It doesn't say you were a good person desiring to be a good person. You just got stuck in a bad situation. No, your sin owned you and you were dead in your sin. Skip down to verse 4. But because... Of his great love for us, God, because of my great work, because of my great potential, because of my ability or what I could offer the kingdom of God. No, verse 4, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, did what? Come on, say it, church. Made us alive with Christ. Even when? When what? When we started turning things around and started going to church. Nope. When I'd finally quit doing whatever that one thing was that I'd been struggling with. Nope. While we were dead in our trespasses, it is by grace you have been saved. Skip to verse 8. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. That's the old covenant. That's why he brings it up. Paul was versed in the old covenant. This was of yourself. I've worked hard enough. I've done all of the right things. I've kept myself from the wrong things. He says, no, it's a gift from God. Verse 9, not by works. Again, that's the old covenant. No one gets to boast. All right, back a little bit more. Romans chapter 8. Again, when you find yourself in those dark nights of the soul... You begin by reminding yourself, God, today was literally the worst. This week has been the worst. I, like Paul, may be the chief among all sinners, and yet you don't love me because I'm so good. I was dead in my sin when you chose me, which is why I can still have hope for your love for me now. And then flip to Romans chapter 8 and hear this golden chain of God's redemption. Romans 8, 28, we're all familiar with, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. But why? Why is that true? Why will God hold you on the days that you think, I've just had the worst day, week, year of my life? It's because of what the next verses say. He says, we know God can do that. And then there's the word for. We know God can bend all these situations for our good and his glory for because those whom he foreknew, he also predestined 
to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. This is before you did anything good or bad. This is before you chose Christ. We have a responsibility to respond to the gospel and say yes to the gospel, but you're not saved because of your yes. You're saved because he knew you. He called you. That's a better covenant. It's an eternal covenant. It's an unconditional covenant. As long as you have your pen out, I want you to write this down in your bulletin. This is a one-liner for those dark nights of the soul. I am no match for God's power to save. I am no match for God's power to save. Oh, rebellious Christian who is running right now. You're in this room, but you are running right now from the grace of God, from the truth of God, from the work of God in your life. And somebody probably dragged you here this morning. That's generally how that works. Maybe you even dragged yourself because you want something better. But listen, You cannot outrun God. I am no match for God's power to save. For the unbeliever, we are super glad that you're here. Church is primarily a place for Christians. So we we talk primarily to Christians. But for unbelievers who don't believe in the saving power of Jesus Christ, we would say, we're glad you're here. And if God has called your name, you are no match for his power to save. Run all you want to. He'll catch you. He will bend your life and your situations to point you to his power alone to save. Ah, But for the Christians who just find themselves in low times, I'm no match. This is for you. This promise in the new covenant is for you. And listen to what verse 11 says. We're almost done. They shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Now, if we're not careful when we read that, it almost sounds like he's saying, we don't need anybody to teach you anything. Just me and Jesus in my Bible, locked in my house, and thank God we have live stream, because now I don't even have to get out of bed on a Sunday morning. Shoot, I don't even have to watch it on a Sunday morning. I can just say, you know, I'll get around sooner or later to watching that live stream, and I'll I'll catch it up. I'm only a month and a half behind. It's going to be fine. Isn't that how that works? That complacency, laziness? No, it's not that. He's not saying we don't need preachers. It's not saying we don't need evangelists to go out and tell people, come and know the Lord. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. We know that's true because of what Jesus said. Paul tells us that it was what Jesus did, what Jesus said, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, where it says Jesus is the one who gave some to be apostles sent out with a message. Prophets, given a message to proclaim. Evangelists, those who would take the gospel message. That's the word uh, evangel that's in there. That the gospel is their message. Pastors, teachers. That can't be true, that we don't need anyone to teach us. What's he talking about? He's talking about an experiential knowing. Come to our church. Here's how you know God. First, dress this way. Second, have this type of vehicle and don't have that type of vehicle. Third, your hair has to look like this. Fourth, your children have to dress like this. Fifth, your children have to go to this type of school. Sixth, we're going to sing these type of songs. Seventh, this is what we're expecting of your response from these songs. And at the end of that, if the lights are low enough and the fog machine's working that day, you will experience the Lord. He says, no, that's not the story of the new covenant. No one will have to say, experience the Lord in this way because each one will. That, that's the word no. The, the word no is a very intimate word that we find there. In fact, it's the type of word that gets used between husbands and wives as they maritally know one another. You will have an intimacy with the Lord that is only yours. And I guarantee right now, listen to me, church, I guarantee everybody sitting in this room has a story with God. You have a story of what it looked like when God pursued you, when God overtook you, If you haven't done it, I would encourage you this week, on your bulletin someplace, write it down in about three sentences. Here's my story with God. Maybe share it with your kids as you do the family discussion in prayer time following today. Maybe share it with a coworker. Like, man, can I just share 
what God did in my life. I'm not pushing anything on you. I'm not telling you what you have to think or believe. Here's my story. Oh, and by the way, here's why I believe that, because we're a sinner. That's the bad news. The worst news is there's nothing I can do about it. The good news is that Jesus came to take all of that in my place and took it to the cross. And the best news is that for those who trust in him, is the promise of eternal life. And find ways to share that story that's only yours. No one can say, know the Lord exactly like Pastor John. Know the Lord exactly like Pastor Harold. Your story should be theirs. Nope, yours is different from everybody else's. It's intimate between you and God. There's no law to keep. There's no sacraments that the church can do to transfer God's grace to you. There's no, not even a magic prayer to pray. It's genuine hearts that have been made alive in Christ, seeing the glory of the gospel that respond with faith and obedience. And I want to ask you as we wrap things up, worship team, if you'd come on up, is that you? Is that your story? Have you seen the desperateness of your own sin? Have you seen the bad news? Have you felt the hopelessness of the worst news that there's literally nothing that you can do about it to fix it? That's a panic moment. That, that's a moment that we should, we should be before God and say, oh no, I'm in really serious trouble. And has your heart then believed yet, but in Christ, God has made a way. In Christ, my sin has been taken to the cross, nailed through his flesh. It is finished. That promise of eternal life, a transformed heart, and mind, and the Holy Spirit now indwelling you to guide you. I ask again, is that you? I don't care if you've been here 20 years. Is that you? Now listen, real careful. I'm not saying doubt your salvation at all. Here's what I think happens most of the time with the people I know. There's a couple that I've carefully pointed backwards to and said, I think they were never a Christian. I think they were here for a long time, and they were never converted. I think most of the time what happens is we drop the umbrella. God has given us salvation. God has shown us the glory of the cross and the gospel. And we live in that. We live under the blessing of that for a while. And then the deceitfulness of sin comes in. The sin that so easily entangles. And then we start, rather than running to the scripture to define our relationship, that was the first fill in the blank, of who God is, how he is to be worshipped, what our relationship is, we start drawing those ideas from the world around us until we're so far from what the Bible says about how we think about God, how we worship God, how we live as Christians, that we have dropped the umbrella and we're living outside the protection. It's still ours. That salvation is still the gift of God in your life. You still have the Holy Spirit convicting you, nagging you, drawing you, but your life is lived in the reign of this world. And I would call you again today, repent. Return to that great salvation. As your family, and this one isn't on here, but for your discussion and prayer, I would encourage you, write down your story with God. Share it with your kids. If you don't have kids, share it with your uh, other family. Share it with your friends. Share it with your coworkers tomorrow. For those of you with kids, I want you to think about some of these simple questions. Does God save us because we're good and not bad? If not, why not? And read together John 3.16. That, that precious thing. Maybe this is a great week to teach your kids to memorize that if they haven't done it already. So what does the new covenant say we must do to be saved? If it's not being good and not being bad, what does it say we must do? Spoiler alert. The answer is in the next question. What does it mean to believe in him? So if the call is to believe in him, to trust in him, to turn from our sins, what does it mean to actually believe in Jesus? And then parents, beautiful, beautiful opportunity to lead your kids to trust in the power of the gospel. Pray together. Ask Jesus to open our eyes to see the great gift of his love and salvation. And if you haven't done it before, man, what a, what a Sunday to surrender your life to him. Would you stand together with me? I want to just pray for us. Before we sing, before we bring tithes and offerings, there's boxes at the back and the front. You, you can uh, just take them up there. We're not going to pass the baskets around. You can do that as we sing, but before we sing, 
I want us to just stand for a second in that call. Is that you? Do the things we just talked about describe you? Or are you trying to live like an old covenant Christian? If so, I promise you, because I did this for a long time, your entire life is marked with frustration. Frustration with yourself that you can't quite seem to walk out of that sin. You can't quite be good enough to accept yourself, to feel good about yourself. It's just hiding all the time. Frustration with God that he never seems to uh, take those things away that you ask him again and again. Oh, hear the call to be a new covenant Christian. Do not put your hope in yourself, but in Christ alone. Would you just stand for a minute and then as we sing, as we remind ourselves that Jesus has fully and once for all paid it all. Bring your tithes and offerings together in response. But let's just stand before God. Let's, let's allow his spirit to soften our hearts before him before we sing. Savior sing thy strength indeed is small but child of weakness watch and pray and find in me thine all in all for Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe my sin had left a crimson stain but he washed me white as snow Lord now indeed I find it's true it's thy power and thine alone that can change the leper's eyes and melt the heart of stone. For nothing good have I whereby thy grace to so I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. For Jesus paid it all, and all to Him I owe. My sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. One more time, let's sing it. And oh, Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. My sin had left the crimson stain, but he Here's our hope. And when before the throne I stand in him complete. Here's our song. Jesus died my soul to save and my lips shall still repeat. One more time. And when before 
before the throne I stand in him complete when Jesus died my soul to My sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Let's just sing it, church. And oh, Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. My sin had left a crimson stain. But he washed in white as snow. And my sin had left a crimson stain. But he washed in white as snow. God, that is infinitely better news. Then I tried really hard this week and I did good. Lord, thank you for the grace that you give into the lives of believers, into my brothers and sisters on the days and the weeks where they feel like they're having success in their walk with you. I pray by your spirit, would you strengthen them? By the enabling power of not only your spirit, but your word, that we would be able to put sin to death and put on Christ. That sin no longer holds us as a slave master, but now we rule over sin in our own lives. Oh, but God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in the moments when they struggle, in the moments where their hearts are low and tempted to give up. Would you remind them that the call to your people is confession, repentance, ask for help, that fellowship with brothers and sisters, and that you hear us when we cry. Even when our sin had left a crimson stain, the power of your blood to save is greater, and I am no match for your power to save. God, now seal your people. By your Spirit again, remind us of your great hand and power in our lives and send us from this place trusting in Christ and no other. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.